Now you have a picture in your book locking up with Muhammad Ali. Uh, what was your interaction? With well, him? see, what happened, Muhammad Ali was making his comeback. This is after, you know, he got the courts, all that stuff with the hand where he got suspended and all that stuff. So he was making a comeback. And, and he would go to different places and make a comeback. Well, he's getting ready for a, a match with the uh, uh, Onoki yeah. in Japan. Well, they wanted a couple of wrestlers to get with Ali to teach him how to uh, how to fall and, and do things so he don't go out there and kill himself. So we hung out for a while. We didn't do anything but laugh and joke. That was Ali. He just played around with you all day. He did. I didn't teach him anything. I tried, but he just, you know, he just didn't take nothing I do. I did say it, but then when he got to the match, I noticed he wished he had learned some stuff because he stayed away from Anoka. But if he had played the game, but Ali just didn't never took it said But he he was about one of the best people I ever met. What surprised me about Muhammad Ali was his size. You know, he's probably about six two, six three. You know, and he he was a big man. So I never realized his height. You know, because on TV he don't look that big. Right. But when you meet him in person, you know, he was a, I would say about 6'3", six, 6'4", six, is what it was. Is it true that that, uh, I don't know if you know this, but the Anoki fight there was originally supposed to be a work, but he didn't want a job to Anoki when he saw how small No, he was. what happened, the boys played a joke. They told, when they told Ali, that, I mean, when they told Anoki that Ali going to double cross him and punch him, knock him out. That's why Anoki stayed on the ground so, so he don't get hit. Okay. But Ali was not going to hit him. The American boys did that. They messed it up. They messed up a million dollar show because they told uh, Onoki that Ali had held it. See, back then you got to realize what, what the difference was. A wrestler could not lose to a boxer. Right. Because wrestling was portrayed then to be legitimate. Our job, my job, was to make the people believe in the sport. The wrestler day job is to entertain the people. My job was never to entertain. It was to make you believe that what I was doing for real. Like, like for example, if you ever watch me do a press slam, the guy would hold the hands out here. Because I didn't want people to think they helping me. And if you helped me while I was doing my press slam, I got mad at you. I would tell you, don't move your hand, move your hand. I'd drop you on your face and, and start over again before. But everybody I press, I wanted to do it myself. You know, I want people to see that I could do this. When I do the 500 pounds, I wanted to do myself. I wanted the people to see I could do. Our job was to make the people believe. Rick and Steamboat and, and, and uh, Rick Flair, they would go out in the audience where they get within three feet of the fan and they would just lay one in on each other. Where the fan is sitting right there, they're only the two feet, two or three feet away. So they would hear the sound and they would see the connection. So there'd be no way in the world that people say, that's not a real chop. Yeah. You know, I seen Joe LaDuke one time, he got juice in the ring and he didn't get enough juice. So now he got to walk to the crowd to go to the, to the, uh, to his car. But he said, well, when the people see that little scratch on my head, they're going to think that there's nothing wrong because, you know, sometimes a little scratch when your heart is pumping, you get a lot mm -hmm. of juice. So you don't have to be a big cut to get a lot of juice. So what do you think Joe LaDuke did? Took that old razor blade, <laughs> just cut his whole forehead up again. So when he go out there, the people see a bigger cut. He took the cut that was there. I see Captain Lou Albano cut the side of his face with a razor blade and stuck his tongue through it. Just so the fans would see it. You know, if you got a broken nose, the promoter say, oh great, let the fans see it. If you break a hand, oh fantastic kid, this is great for the business. You get a broken nose, you get two black eyes, oh the promoter went nuts, that was wonderful. The first time that I broke Huck Hogan's nose, you know, it's a match, that match, when if you watch on TV, it's in the spectrum, got the spectrum in the center. Hogan cover me, but his butt is here and his head is down here. So I just bring the knee up to knee him in the head. Hogan, at the same time I brought my knee up, lift his head up. Yeah. I broke his nose. Right in the match. But you would never know it because Hogan and Al, we kept going. He finished that match with a broken nose. Wow. And nobody knew. He, but he, every time I see Hogan, he remembered that. He said, you remember when you broke my nose?